Section 4 of The Mystery of the Ocean Star This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Robert Hoffman The Mystery of the Ocean Star by W. Clark Russell Section 4 Pictures at Sea Once in the Bay of Bengal, I witnessed from the deck of a ship named the Hugamont a sight the like of which, had I read a description of it, I should have believed impossible in nature. The weather had been gloomy and sullen throughout the day. The swell was a sickly jumble of somber green folds sulkily shouldering one another as they ran, and I noticed that they likewise moved very sluggishly as oil might, or water thick with ooze. A light air slipped from one swinging brow to another, but it had not weight enough to steady the canvas, and the ship rolled dismally, burying her sides with a regular sea-sawing of the channel's lifted foaming, whilst the blows of the sails against the masts sent blasts of noise like the explosions of nine-pounders vibrating through the dusky air. The look of the sky was more menacing than the warnings of the glass, low as the mercury stood. That a hurricane was not far off was not to be doubted, but we believed ourselves to be on the southern verge of it, and that we should, therefore, escape the central rage, though it was more than probable that we should encounter the lighter tempest flying off the back wing of the storm fiend as he passed. At five o'clock in the afternoon, though the sun then stood many degrees above the horizon, it was so dark that the men had to feel about for the ropes. The ship having been stripped of her canvas, the noises aloft were small and weak, whilst the straining sounds from the bulkheads and strong fastenings in the cabins and hold were so muffled by battened hatches and tarpaulined skylights that they scarcely caught the ear. The dismaying influence of the dark, still shadow on high showed strongly in the glimmering faces of the men. I was but a lad at the time in making my second voyage, and so was comparatively unseasoned and I was awed and alarmed by this sullen gloom, whose preternatural complexion made you think of having floated into some sunless world of waters, over which no star ever sparkled, over whose circle of indigo no moon ever lifted a crimson brow, and whose atmosphere was to blacken yet as the deeper solitudes were penetrated. One yearned for a flash of lightning, for a growl of distant thunder, for any quality of the familiar to neutralize the superstitious fears inspired by this afternoon darkness, imperturbably tincturing its substance into the raven hue of midnight. We spoke in whispers. The mate receiving his orders from the captain, who delivered them in a low voice, would approach the men close before repeating them, as though he durst not break the stillness by bawling. There was an inconsolable sobbing of water alongside, and at long intervals, audible only at moments when the breathless hang of the ship upon the slope of some liquid brow left the fabric death-like, you heard a sort of moaning noise in the air, vague and indeterminable, echoes no doubt from the field of battle that was yet leagues distant. At eight o'clock it was pitch dark. The atmosphere was now breathless. Though I had been on deck since six, I had not witnessed once in any quarter of the horizon the faintest glare of lightning. A dim and rusty tinge of red had filtered into the west when the sun set, but the ugly illumination faded quickly. I went below to turn in, but finding that others of the watch I belonged to remained on deck, I returned, and, leaning over the poop rail, stood straining my eyes against the amazing blindness of the night, in vain search of any break of radiance upon the sea-line. The confused swell rolled to the ship in a huddle of liquid blocks of blackness, amid which large, rich clouds of phosphor flashed with the mild play of sheet lightning. On a sudden, a young shipman who was standing near bade me, in a soft voice, look right astern. The ship's head lay about west-southwest, and over the taffrail in the ebon void there I witnessed a very delicate hectic, a kind of pinkish tinge sifting through the blackness. It resembled the slow floating upwards of a prodigious body of red smoke, or of smoke colored with the flames of a continent on fire immeasurably distant. 
Its space on the horizon, when first viewed, might be measured by the breadth of our taffrail, but in a short time it had rolled along past either quarter till it occupied the whole of the sea line astern, meanwhile continually ascending as though formed of a substance apart from the clouds, and it grew clearer and brighter as its surface enlarged, and presently the whole of the eastern and southern sky was aglow with it. There is no color or combination of colors that I am acquainted with by which I should be able to define the astonishing complexion of this light. I must speak of it as pink, though a painter would not thus express it. Its westernmost verge did not extend beyond our mastheads. Nevertheless, the radiance cast a phantasmal illumination upon the black sky down to the confines of the ocean, and the binuous sea line was plain the whole horizon round as though limed with a trembling sweep of a brush dipped in india ink in my brief eight years of seafaring life i have seen the ships i was in colored by some strange many lovely and a few terrifying lights but the like of this midnight lustre crimsoning the sooty heavens without revealing a single break amid the compacted masses of vapor under which it rolled i had never beheld before i have never beheld since and to be plain comprehending its cyclonic significance i never wish to behold again the mysterious magical light was upon the sails upon the decks upon the faces and forms of the crew but the sea lay black as thunder under it everything was shadowless in it nothing cast an image i extended my arm over the white top of the hen coop but the limb threw no reflection the radiance was circumambient, encompassing as mist is, but clear as glass. Looking upward, I could see the vane at the royal masthead standing like a black streak in the mystic sheen, and to the very flying jibboom end the ship floated as plain to the gaze as ever she could have been submitted by the full moon riding high. What was the hidden luminary that shed this light? Whence arose this effulgent midnight mist? The illumination might have passed for the setting of the sun, going down on the wrong side of the world. It was an atmospheric effect, beautiful, thrilling, marvelous, and terrifying, too. Many, I doubt not, have witnessed the same spectacle under the heights in which that pale, strange shining happened. It was enough to make all hands of us suppose that a tempest of cyclonic force would burst upon us soon, and when in about half an hour the luster, after waning into a tarnished orange, died out into impenetrable blackness, we stood by ready for what we made sure was to follow. It blew indeed, though not with hurricane power. There was so much lightning for fifteen or twenty minutes that the sky seemed filled with yellow and violet darts writhing their arrowy lengths like serpents as they vanished in the sea that flashed back whole sheets of fire to the lancing of the leaven brands. The weather then grew commonplace enough, plenty of wet, a high foaming sea, the ship hove to under the storm trysail, plunging and laboring with screaming rigging, an ashen dawn with sulphur-colored scud blowing up from the horizon, like smoke from the chimneys of a city of factories, and then at noon a fine day, a roasting sun overhead, and the vessel under fast drying canvas, lazily stemming the high swell left by the gale so much for one atmospheric effect of an intertropical storm. One turns willingly to the gentle oceanic picture. As on shore, so at sea. It is out of moonlight that you obtain the daintiest and most fairy-like effects. What is there tenderer in all nature than the spectacle of moonrise on the ocean when the orb, standing hidden a minute or two behind some delicate line of vapor, whose extremities her beams color to the aspect of lunar rainbows, sheds a silver streak of icy light upon the black line of the seaboard, until it looks like liquid ivory in the act of arching over in a gush of brilliant whiteness, as froth from the head of a breaker. I think one misses the best of the moonlight effects when on board a steamer. There is little or nothing in the fabric, forever storming along, for the crystal beam to beautify. The structure, vibrating to the thunder of her engines, rushes onwards too swiftly for the glorification by the cold rays of the bland satellite. It is from the deck of a sailing ship that you command in perfection the wonders and splendors of the oceanic amphitheater, 
witness in such wise that your heart receives it into the whole spirit of the scenic grandeurs of that mighty stage the glowing galleries of the west the burning pavilions into which the sun retires the cloud pinions smitten into mild glory by venus blazing jewel-like in a sphere of light in which the adjacent stars are hidden as by moonshine the gathering of a storm-cloud of a glassy and livid brow with the restless lifting of the waters to its purple shadow the flight of the falling body of fire bursting into a storm of sparks as it seems to strike the dark and distant sea-line over which a few stars are peeping like eyes of gigantic shapes whose shadowy forms the imagination will not find it hard to distinguish a sailing ship moves quietly onwards or lying restfully in the heart of a calm offers a surface upon which the magic brushes of the moon will paint a hundred lovely things the clear sharp shadows resemble jet inlaid upon the ivory of the planks the spaces of splendor upon the yards between the black dyes wrought by the interception of the reflection of the end of a boom or the clue of a sail are like bands of shining silver there is nothing fairer than the spectacle of a sleeping ship with her canvas hanging silent from the yards stealing out to the light of the moon that soars sparkling as if wet from the sea the white glory gushes veil-like to the trucks high aloft in the clear obscure and sinks wanly from sail to sail until the fabric that a little while before was but a deeper shade upon the evening dusk gleams out into an inexpressible loveliness of phantom form and airy substance stars bright as caldridge's tiny sun amid the branches sparkle in brass and glass and along the rails there is a diamond twinkling of dew and the sheen upon the canvas seems to overflow the bolt ropes and frame the irradiated spaces with a slender atmosphere of light delicate as mist to the small swaying of the vessel the moonshine on her decks flows like running rivulets of quicksilver the shadows alternate with the brightness and the reflected filigree of the rigging crawling to the swing of the struck me makes one think of the thin boughs of a leafless tree stirred by the wind against some snow-clad rise one moonlight effect i recall with delight it was a dark tropical evening there was a light air blowing of sufficient weight to keep the sails asleep and a long troubled swell was heaving from the north the stars shone very clearly but the night lay dark upon the ocean and you only knew where the sea line was by observing where the luminary ceased to shine on a sudden a pale greenish hue in the east announced the rising of the moon the rugged horizon ran in ink against that lunar dawn and as the orb lifted her brilliant disk clear of the ebon welter the outline of a sailing ship showed to the right of her soon she had climbed right over the vessel her glorious wake ran fan-like in a turbulent service of silver far along the heaving waters and in the middle of this radiant river sailed the ship the wind right astern of her her yard square studding sails out on both sides but all of the deepest dye of blackness. There is nothing in language to convey this picture, to express this vision, rather, I see it now, the stately rolling of the dark pyramids of cloths, an occasional flash of white fire from her side or decks, and the mild glory over her stern showing in arches of silver under the curves of her sails. As she passed out of the moon's reflection she grew pale, mist-like, elusive, it is indeed the atmospheric effects of the sea which make it so rich in symbolism the deep is eternity materialized so to speak i always regard the ocean as a form of infinity rendered comprehensible to human intelligence by an apparition of confines which yet do not bound it it is certain that we find in it our most pregnant imagery of life and death the picture of the ship i have just written about abounded in human significance the full force of which you would have understood had you watched the stately, spacious-winged fabric drawing out from the throbbing and palpitating river of silver moonlight, passing in spectral pallor and vanishing among the folds of the liquid dusk astern. It was something to accept as an illustration of that form of unreality which the poet indicates in speaking of life as a dream between a sleep and a sleep. 
but enough of such moralizing a fine effect is often produced by a conflict of moonlight and lightning i witnessed a magnificent scene of this kind in the indian ocean the island of amsterdam in sight on the starboard quarter there was a full moon in the north and in the south hung a vast bank of clouds charged with fire and thunder the early gusts of this electric storm broke away great wings of vapor from the shoulder of the main body and sent them speeding athwart the moon the shining of the luminary was ghastly rendered so by the alternations of her own light darting wildly over the edge of the driven clouds with the quick dazzle of the southern flashes her beam seemed to be colored by the electric leapings it was the eye of course that carried the reflection of the blue and sun-bright darts to the northern illumination but the effect was as though the lightning struck its own hellish quality into the fabric of the silver beams as they fell from the rims of the flying clouds the combined illumination put a new and monstrous face upon the ocean it made you think of a dead sea complexion to a very mockery of vitality by the light of such flames as those from which milton's fiend rose to steer his flight to dry land the effects of lightning upon the ocean are full of dramatic surprises moonlight is all sweetness and softness and blandness but the revelations of the electric dart are startling with something of a tragic nature in them i was once becalmed in highly phosphorescent waters but the surface was so still that the few gleams visible in the dark profound were faint as the reflection of a star riding upon the heave of a hidden swell a cloud gathered overhead and its sooty belly seemed to lean for support upon our scarcely swaying trucks suddenly it rained one should spend some months in jamaica to understand the meaning of such a shower as this in a few moments our decks were half full of water the scuppers sobbing madly the roaring of the rain and the hail smiting the ocean drowned all other sounds the sea was so phosphorescent that a piece of wood dropped overboard chipped out fire as though it had burst into flames judge then of the effect of that niagara fall of rain and hail the ocean was flashed up into a plane of fire it swept sparkling in one vast incandescent sheet to its limits dimming into sickly sulphur as it approached the horizon you might suppose that such an illumination as this would have revealed anything afloat upon it but though i took a long look round being deeply impressed by this sudden wonderful burning of the ocean i saw nothing till all at once the darkness was split by a flash of lightning that leapt from the clouds away over our foreyardum and shot into the water as it seemed to me a league distant on our starboard quarter and then to this mighty flare there sprang out upon the view a large ship well within a mile of us snug down to her topsails the sight made me catch my breath for an instant for the wonder of it lay in her having been invisible until the lightning threw her up so bright was the water with the lashing of the rain one waited for a second flash to make sure and i dare say had she foundered before it came there would not have been people wanting amongst us to swear that they had seen the phantom ship indeed it is quite possible that that grand old legend had its origin in some atmospheric effect due to lightning moonshine or fog i have sometimes at sea but more often in our narrow waters watched a ship for a few moments removed my gaze and thinking of her presently looked for her again and found her gone this is one of those mysterious disappearances with which all seamen are acquainted the evanishment however grows more perplexing when after searching for the vessel and believing her to be gone for good you look for her again later on and find her almost in the same place a thing of this kind would have been accepted by the early mariner as a miracle he would have come home with a yarn about it as long as his arm and so fired the first poetically minded wedding guest he could constrain with his eye with visions and fancies of a spectral ship be this as it will disappearances and reappearances of this kind can be due to nothing but the subtle and imperceptible gathering of haze about the object mist will often take its complexion from the atmosphere i have seen a bank of haze so skylike and azure that but for the curvature of the sea-line under it caused by the deflection sweep of its base i should have accepted it as pure blue air 
white mists also of a slightly opaline tincture corresponding to perfection with the hue of the heavens beyond i have detected only by the apparent depression of the horizon under them a ship may be in the act of piercing one of these elusive veils with her flying jibboom when you first catch sight of her she is as plain in your sight as your own vessel yet when you seek her a minute after she has vanished and there is nothing in the sombre or sunny texture of the stuff she has entered into to persuade you that what you are viewing is not the same brown or cellulean sky that stands over and on either hand of it to the mariner the fog is about the most obnoxious of all the conditions of his vocation he is not likely to understand me then when i speak of its beauties yet i must assure him nevertheless that many lovely atmospheric and other effects are produced on the waters by those luminous enfolding bodies of vapors the silence of whose white caverns is violated in these scientific times by the horrible braying of the steam horn and the terrified fluttering of the engine-room bell the kind of fog i have in my mind is the snow-like body of vapor sometimes not very much taller than the folkestone cliffs sometimes so low-lying indeed that you may see the lofty spars of a big ship forking out of it into the blue air and bright sunshine when the rest of the structure is as absolutely hidden as an object rolled up in wool as a rule very little wind accompanies these appearances the mass of delicate smoke-like sparkling particles slides along softly and it is therefore slow and tender in its revelation and it submits nothing which the manner of its discovery does not render beautiful a man standing on the deck of a ship in the heart of a soft and gleaming thickness may not be able to see the mainmast from the distance of the wheel the silence is peculiar there is a certain quality of oppressiveness in it nor is this wholly fanciful for though there be a deep hush on the sea yet when you emerge into clear air the difference between the stillness you have quitted and that which you have entered is instantly perceptible presently there is a little flaw a chasm opens in the blind and luminous body of whiteness the space of water that glances like steel around the ship enlarges its narrow horizon there is a general brightening of light though all the forward part of the ship is still hidden in the smother and the only mast you can see looks as if it were sawed off a few feet above the deck if the coast be nigh or ships be at hand there will happen now a slow stealing out of objects and the sight is one which i think every man who has seen it will recall with admiration off dover a ship i was aboard of sailed into such a fog as i am describing and lay without motion for some hours in the midst of it any trickle of tide there may have been kept company with the vapour there was no air and the water came out of the thickness to the bends with the polish and gleam of oil there was nothing to break the quiet but the distant faint thunder of wash of surf or sometimes the remote tinkling of a ship's bell or the rattle of a little winch in some nearer craft trembling upon the ear like the sound of musketry presently there was a movement of wind and as the soft fingers of the draught of air tenderly drew aside the curtains of the mist the pictures offered were a series of beautiful surprises all about us stood the white fog upon the sea in elbows and points in seams ravines and dowgels like to the scarred and precipitous front of chalk cliffs and now there would ooze out a little smack whose shadow within the vapour held you speculating till the sunshine smote it into the proportions and colour of some cutter or lugger-rigged craft with reddish mainsail gently swaying and so wester over the tie-rail and now as the snow-like thickness was rent afresh some stout brig with blacker checkered sides and a blue vein of smoke going up straight out of her galley chimney and then arching over like the curl of a plume would be unveiled and no matter how ugly the craft was that would be thus suddenly confessed the witchery of the shining background of cloud entered her and submitted her as dainty and delightful full of a grace that owed nothing to form so that even a wretched little coaster with boom for sail and a suit of canvas as many colored as joseph's coat met the eye clothed with beauty from the buttons of her trucks down to the tremulous silver of the reflection of her sails under her then presently glimpses of the land were to be had 
the flash of sunward staring windows ashore, the vivid green of verdure sloping to the edge of the white abrupt, a steamer with raking funnels cautiously coming out, the twinkle of foam upon the margin of gray shingle. But you need a mountainous land to obtain the highest and choicest effects of fog revealments. The noblest show in this way that I ever beheld was off Mossel Bay on the South African coast. There the inland mountains tower to an elevation that, though they may be ten or fifteen miles distant, seem to enable them to cast the twilight of their Andean shadows upon the ship. It is like beholding the birth of a world, to mark those titanic peaks growing out of the white envelopment, as though creation were busy in yonder void, and shaping a vast territory out of a sheer chaotic blindness. Another lovely effect I have often gazed at with delight. I mean the vision of a ship hovering on the horizon, with an atmosphere of shivering brightness between her and the sea-line. Then, with the eye or with the telescope, she looks to be floating in the blue air. I have seen an airy space of pearl hanging like a cloud over the sea-boundary, and I have watched it lifting and lengthening, one shining outline rising to another out of the sea, until three stately pyramids of canvas have been hove up, and then, presently, the hall rose to complete the symmetrical fabric, and thus apparently afloat in the azure, the ship has sailed towards us without appearing to touch the sea until the line of the horizon behind her was level with her counter. Effraction or some like quality productive of atmospheric effects will yield many queer and even startling ocean pictures. The mate of a vessel once called my attention to a ship about four miles distant, right abeam. There was a light wind, and the day was wonderfully fine and clear. The stranger was under all plain sail, and her yards braced fore and aft, which enabled us to obtain a good view of her canvas. She was so incredibly distorted by the atmosphere as to be unrecognizable as a ship, in the sense I mean of that term. Her masts were curved like the prongs of a pitchfork. Her hull rounded like the back of a hog. Her sails, ludicrously elongated, her jibbooms twisted into a figure beyond description. I have no doubt we presented the same convulsed appearance to her. Every man who saw her broke into a loud laugh. Yet she was an object to put some queer ideas into the imaginative brain, and I have little doubt that the paternity of many a singular superstition of the sea might be traced to such atmospheric caprices as this. The effect of a red sunset upon a ship sailing quietly along is a choice study full of sweetness. The rigging shines like wires of brass, the sails like cloth of gold. There are crimson stars wherever there are windows. Against the soft evening blue she glides glorious as a fabric richly gilt. Sometimes the slow withdrawal of the western splendor from her may be watched. Then her hall will be dark with evening shadow, whilst the light, like a golden veil lifted off her by an invisible hand, slides upward from one rounded stretch of canvas to another, till, burning for a breath, like a streak of fire in the dog vein at the lofty masthead, it vanishes, and the structure floats gray as the ash of tobacco. In this withdrawal of the sun, and in the gathering of the shadows of night at sea, there is a certain melancholy, but I do not think it can be compared with the spirit of desolation you find in the breaking of the dawn over the ocean. The passage from sunlight to darkness, even in the tropics, is not so swift, but that the mind, so to speak, has time to accept the change. But there is something in the cold, spiritless gray of dawn that always did and still does affect my spirits at sea. The froth, of the running billow steals out ghastly to the faint, cheerless, and forbidding light. Chilly as the night may have been, a new edge of cold seems to have come into the air, with the sifting of the melancholy spectral tinge of gray into the east. The light puts a hollow look into the face of the seaman. The aspect of his ship is full of bleakness. The stars are gone, the skies are cold and the voices of the wind aloft are like a frosty whistling through clenched teeth. A mere fancy, of course, which is instantly dissolved by the first level, sparkling beam of the rising sun, but then it is fancy that makes up the life of the sea, for without it what is the vocation but a dull routine of setting and furling sail, of masticating hard beef and pork, 
of slushing masts, washing decks, and polishing brasswork. The spacious liquid arena is prodigal of inspiration and of delight to anyone who shall carry imagination away with him on a voyage. There may be twenty different things to look at at once, and every one richer, sweeter, and more ennobling than the greatest of human poems to the heart that knows how to watch and receive. The shadow of a dark cloud over a ship, with the sunshine streaming white in the clear blue foaming seas around, the vision of the iceberg at night, coloring the black atmosphere with a radiance of its own, the tropical blue of the horizon, lifting into brassy brightness to the central dazzle of the sun, the airy dyes of the evening over a ship in the far loneliness of the mid-ocean, scores of such sights there are but what magic is there in human pen to express them the majesty of the creator is nowhere so apparent the spirit of the universe is nowhere else so present those who know most dare least in their desire to reproduce what other response is there for the heart to make to the full recognition of the eye but the silence of adoration End of section 4 Recording by Robert Hoffman